Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest uh, event, latest wild art event, um, and it's Flower Power. So today we're going to be talking to Victoria Hillman, one of the wild art judges, of course, about her approach to photography. So Vic's all lined up in, a, in my virtual green room, uh, and we'll get to talking to her right after this. Hello, Vic. Hello. And you're you're speaking to us live from Switzerland. I I am indeed. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely view of the Swiss Alps out out the window. Um, Which I think yeah. was was where where we talked to you last time. Actually, wasn't it? It was. We yeah. <laughs> yeah. Were, were you not? Were you were sat on? Um, were you sat on some stairs or something? In a, uh, I I was sat in a stairwell um, of a training centre last time we spoke. But now we're we're actually we have an apartment. So. I'm sat in the apartment, which is much more comfortable. Brilliant. Okay. <laughs> Glad to hear it. So no concrete steps this time. No. no. <laughs> Good. Um, before we get going, I just thought I'd catch up with a few things for everybody. Um, so uh, don't forget that today is the last day for to enter human nature. Um, it closes at midnight UK time, so don't get caught out by the time zone if you live outside the UK. Um, and we're currently on British summer time, so that's uh, GMT plus one. Uh, so you have until midnight. The system automatically cuts off uh, at midnight, so you won't be able to enter if you if you miss if you miss the time. So you still got a few hours left. Um, that's going to be a really good category to enter, actually, if you haven't already done so. Um, it's slightly more tricky than some of the others. So uh, yeah, I, you know, I would I would definitely have a go at that one if you got some images that fit so don't forget that human nature is a mixture of um, wildlife with a human element uh, to it, whatever that may be it might be a positive or negative uh, story to that image but uh, anyway go and have a look at the website and, and don't make and uh, do make sure that you don't miss out on that category which closes in just a few hours time um, if you haven't seen the space top 100 yet then you are missing out because that was an amazing category full of some incredible photography so go and have a look at the website and go and have a look at that top 100 and if you made that list very well done to you because that was extremely competitive with some with some gripping photography in it um, so go and take a look at that list um, and behavior I'm going to be announcing those winners uh, next weekend on the 7th of August with William. I think it's going to be 6 p.m. I'll post that event probably tomorrow on the YouTube channel and the Facebook page. So look out for that. So that's a winner's announcement for behavior. OK, well, I think that's that's all those sort of little bits and pieces caught up with. So Vic, why don't we start off by just talking a little bit about uh, abstracts, which is your category, which starts, well, I mean, it's, it's already open for entries, but it, it's a, a sort of focus for August and it closes at the end of, uh, end of August. Um, it was one of my favorite categories last year, actually, because it produced some extraordinary photography. Um, so why don't, why don't you explain a little bit about what abstracts is all about from your point of view? And, and we'll show some of the winners from last year as well, just to give people a flavor, you know, of what was entered into that category last year. Yeah, so ab abstract is really about taking a different view of nature as a whole. So it could it could be like a, a close up of some scales or some skin or an eye. It could be you know a wide view using multiple exposures or intentional camera movement. It's it's really it, the idea behind it is to let your creativity show and create something that is completely different, much more artistic and creative. Um, that kind of sums up the beauty of what you're trying to photograph, but in that less traditional sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'll do is, is I thought we'd do is we'd share just uh, the sort of top three images from last year and just go through those quickly, just to give people a flavor of, of what was entered last year and, and why we picked it out. Um, and as I said, if you do, if you are watching live uh, and you want to ask Vic any questions as we go through, um, you know, through the, the session this afternoon, then then do please put it in the comments or even just pop by and say hello. I see we've got a couple of people on already. Uh, Rachel Piper. Hi, Rachel. Uh, she says, hi, everyone. And uh, Michael Snedick. He says, hello, Robin Victoria. Swiss Alps, my fave location in Europe. 
Well, it's not a place I've been to for probably oh, <laughs> probably 30 years. Honestly, it's been so long since I've been there. But it's a beautiful, beautiful place. But, uh, yeah, agree. Anyway, Michael, I hope you're well. Um, okay, so let me share. Let's share some of those uh, some of those pictures. Uh, if I just bring those up on the screen for everybody. Um, so I know Rachel's on. Uh, this is Rachel Piper's image, uh, and she was our gold award winner from last year. And I think it's pretty obvious what made this stand out. Um, and we we saw quite a lot of spiders webs, didn't we? In abstracts. Um, we did, yeah. Yeah, but but what caught your eye with this one? It's the colours. Um, when you get close, when you've got just the right light from the right angle, and to a degree, the right amount of kind of dampness as well, you get this beautiful array of colours that can actually be seen in the silk of the spider's web. Um, now, no, most people when they see a spider's web, it's maybe you see it at a distance, or you know, you try and photograph the whole thing. But you know, when you when you just have those conditions absolutely perfect, it's just the colours and the banding of those colours through the yeah. silk as well. Yeah, it's a real sort of kaleidoscope, isn't it, this image? Mm, it's it's, it's it beautiful. Is. And actually, the square crop is quite unusual as well, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not a big fan of, of square crops normally, but actually it works really, really well for this one. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. But, uh, no, so that was that's a that was a fantastic image. Really, really stood out last year, and it, it, it sort of epitomizes really what the category is all about. It's the you know it's those sort of not necessarily closer details, but it's those more unusual details that we see in nature um, that perhaps people don't concentrate on a lot. You know, it's it's you know they it, it's it's more of a closer interpretation or a more artistic interpretation, you know, of, of wildlife and nature. So, okay. So our second image, again, was extraordinary. Um, and this is one of those sort of hothouse images from Kew Gardens uh, by Steve Palmer, uh, who picked up our Silver Award last year. Uh, and I think, again, people can see, you know, the appeal of this. There's just sort of so much going on, isn't there? Uh, you know a little bit more about these images than I do, Vic. So why don't you explain yeah. you know, so what I've... this is and how it was taken? I, I've actually seen quite a lot of, of hot house images, um, if you want to kind of turn, um, group them all together. And a lot of them are actually taken through the window from the outside of the house, not the inside. And what it is, it's the array of plants pushed up against the windows um, to create them. Most of the time, there's a lot more to it than that. I've made it sound really simple. It, it's really not that simple. Mm. But what you get is you get this amazing like array of textures and colors um, of all the plants together and also like some of the the uh, the lines and that that you actually have on the windows um, they've kind of I guess like appeared over time but for me one of the things I really loved about this one when I see a lot of hothouse images it tends to be a lot of greens you don't see many other colors in it but for this you've got that lovely kind of selection of different colors in there which mm. I think just really adds to it and yeah. for me, it looks more like a painting. It looks more like one of those kind of old, art, like history of art or, um, sorry, botanical, historical paintings. Yes, and yeah, one well, of sort of Victorian era type, era type yeah. paintings. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and this, you know, what I liked about Abstracts last year, that it really got to the bottom of what this competition is all about. And it's about, you know, celebrating the artistic side of wildlife photography. So sort of getting away from the more literal representations of things. Uh, and, and that's why I just found it so inspiring sort of seeing this stuff coming in last year. It wasn't a category that that had the most entries in it. But I think uh, overall, as, as you know, in terms of quality and in terms of, you know, sort of differences in ideas and ideas and approaches, I think it was the most diverse. And, I, I, you know, it was certainly yeah. one of the best, best quality categories that we had last year. Uh, it was, you know, yeah. I, 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 I really took a lot of inspiration from agree. it. Yeah. 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 Sure. So it's, it's definitely one to have a go at. And and actually, it's one of those categories that I think sort of pushes you as a photographer and and you think about, makes you think about things in slightly different ways, which again is what this competition is all about. It's not just a photography competition. It's not just people pitting their images against each other. It's trying to take people on a journey you know, and developing their photography and their skills by looking at what other people are doing and being inspired by that. You know, it's 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 a community that that I want this competition to 
uh, to, to engender really is just this sort of whole community where people are just sharing ideas and and taking their own photography on to new levels and that's that's what it's all about for me but anyway so going on to our silver uh, sorry our bronze award winner which was trey anfield um again this is something completely different this is um you know a panning technique a slow shutter speed so you're getting that sort of movement a motion blur uh, it would have been good for motion as well this image actually um you know there was some certainly some crossovers there but uh, again what made this stand out for you vic i think you, you see a lot of intentional camera movement with um particularly bluebell woodland in the springtime and yeah. you don't see that many really creative ones with wildlife and um, for me for this one i like the fact that tutor's actually running away um it's not facing the camera it's not completely side on it's also hidden in amongst the grass as well and actually i like the use of monochrome um yeah. because i think that actually really really adds adds to it you just get again it, it's i mean for me like the abstracts category it's more it's really pushing the boundaries of kind of photography and, and art trying to bring the two very much together and this is you know one thing that i love about this category and, and like with my own photography it's about pushing those boundaries and really seeing what you can come up with that is away from that normal image and mm. and this is just another one that that really does that yeah and i've said this before you know in some of these lives that you know if you're talking purely about competitions and we're, we're talking about judges what judges look for are images they've not seen before or approaches they've not seen before you know because that makes them stop going through this long list of images they go oh that's a bit interesting let me have a closer look at that and oh i've not quite seen that approach before uh, if you make a judge a judge stop when they're looking through you know the hundreds of images that they, they they get in front of them then that's that's what you're trying to achieve is to grab that attention initially and get them to draw them in and get them to have a closer look at something uh, so so that make that's the sort of start of or those are the sort of foundations of a good competition image if you can do that do something a little different so uh, yeah and, and okay. i say just to, just to add to that quickly as well is as a judge you also don't you don't want to see copies of images that have previously been awarded at any right. level in the competition. Be inspired by them for sure, and then put your own twist on it. Because I I can tell you from experience, you know, from competitions that you know, like other competitions I've judged, when you see an image come up that is almost a like for like copy of something that was awarded a year or two years before, it won't get anywhere. It's like oh well, I've seen that before. Yeah. Oh, exactly. In so, fact, I, I I did a video on five five mistakes people make when they enter photography competitions, and copycat images was one of the things that I mentioned um, was to try and avoid doing that because you know it's it's not new anymore. And the the example I used was diving gannets. Um, mm. you know, so we've all we've all seen those images so many. I mean, they are amazing, but it's been seen and done before. So uh, if you are the first person to do something like that, then you're going to do very, very well in a competition because that's the sort of image that will grab a judge's attention if they haven't seen it before. And they go, oh, wow, let me have a look at that. That's incredible. That's a brilliant approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you're trying to, to, to do when you're thinking about competition photography. So, okay, well, let me stop sharing that screen and we'll bring up some of your um, some of your flower uh, images uh, in a sec. So let me just let me just take that remove that from the stream for a second right okay so i'll catch up with a couple of comments a couple more people saying hello so jane o'connor's on hi jane um she says hi robin victoria from Brittany. Uh, so hello jane hope you're well and uh, ben pullitz is on as well hi ben um and i think most people in the uk are getting ready to watch the lionesses actually in the euros final so um come on the lionesses that's what i say we just we just got an easy game against germany it'll be be no trouble <laughs> You know, our record against Germany. <laughs> anyway. Right. Let me just get to the right place and get your images up. And we'll start talking about. Um, let's bring that up. And we'll start talking about your approach to flower photography, which is what this live is all about. Now, I have to say that Vic has been a tremendous influence on my own photography. Um, and it's this sort of style that really grabbed my attention when I first saw some of your work. Uh, 
And I'm not saying I've, I've, I've not copied Vic. I've just used some of, well, some of Vic's um, techniques and applied it to my own photography. So I thought we'd, we'd have a chat about, you know, show some of Victoria's images, have a chat about how, you know, you go about it and some of the techniques you employ. Um, so let's bring up your, your first image by sharing, by sharing the screen. So this is the one I used, obviously, for the, um, you know, for the thumbnail, for the video thumbnail. And I absolutely love this. And I, I have an inkling as to how you did it, but I can't, I, well, I, I can't get anywhere near this in terms of, I've tried, I can tell you. but I'm guessing it was a foggy morning. Am I, am I right? It's, it's all about the weather. And actually, yeah. I'd say that for probably 95% of my images, it's about the weather. So this woodland, it's this bluebell woodland, it is quite high up. It's it's not far from where I live at home, actually. It's only about 15 minutes, but it's on top of the Mendips. Yeah. So you do get these mornings where it's really, really, it's kind of foggy or actually verging on low cloud sometimes. And you get this amazing kind of appearance in the woodland because it just swamps everything, just kind of comes in and everything gets enclosed by it. And yeah, it, it had been quite damp as well. So if you look closely at this one, you can actually see the water droplets um, on let's the bluebells. Let's see if I can zoom in on well. it. Uh, how do I do that? Hold on. Oh, there we go. And just yeah, be able to just, make out some of the water Just about droplets make those out. Yeah, yeah. And, stem here. Yeah. And it's really, it's, it is, but images like this, they're, they're overexposed um, slightly. Mm. And it's, when you're in a bluebell woodland, it can be quite hard because obviously you have trees as well. And what you don't want is a whopping great big tree trunk sticking up out the back um, or the shadow yeah. of one. Um, so it's about positioning, finding flowers that work. So this particular flower, the one that's standing up above everything else, was that bit taller than the rest of them. So it allowed me to focus on that. And using a nice wide open aperture is, you know, for anyone that knows my style, I rarely go above 3.5 with my aperture. Um, I like that wide open aperture because it allows me to blur everything else out. And it's just focusing on that one blue, one blue bell, but also white balance as well. So I will, I kind of veer more towards the cooler white balance range mm. than maybe like the warmer, the daylight or the warmer one. And that actually just helps kind of add to the, the atmosphere. Of it. Yeah. So uh, when you're talking about overexposing, how many, you know, uh, would, you be, would you be a stop over here perhaps or? Um, no, probably it was, it was one of those mornings where it was quite, it was very, very foggy, but also very bright. Yeah. So actually I didn't need to do too much. Um, so it's probably not even a stop. It might be a third right. or two thirds. Yeah. Okay. And I've, incidentally, I've... I mean, I visited this woodland, uh, woodland a lot. I've only ever had these conditions once in about yeah. six or seven years. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 talk about that as well when we come on to you know perhaps another one of your images too because it it is all about the conditions, isn't it? And when I saw this image, I, I kind of knew it was because it's you know you need that you know you need that sort of um, almost sort of high key cloudy atmosphere to be able to to create this because you're just not going to do it by going into a local woodland and just simply overexposing because it, you, you're just not going to get this effect. So you just have to wait for the conditions. And when you see them arrive, you just, you have to make the, you know, you have to make the most of them. And I think that it's knowing your subject and knowing the locations well, that helps you do this, which is why shooting locally, I think is, is a real benefit to your photography because you, you know, you do know the locations where you know how the light works, you know how the weather reacts, you know what to expect. So you're not going in there blind. And I think it's, it's knowing what can happen and knowing, you know, how you can work with the conditions. I think, you know, it, it, then you can create images like this. Uh, so the other thing is that, you know, what lens are you using here? Because, I mean, uh, aperture's all, all very well, but if you're using 3.5 on a 35 mil lens, for example, you're still going to get loads in focus just simply because of the focal length. So you use a 180 macro, don't you? I do. I use a Sigma 180 macro. It is my go-to lens for pretty much all my macro work. Yeah, yeah. And because normally, I'll show people, I mean, I guess most people have the standard 105 or 100 mil macro and that's my Nikon 105 macro which I use quite a lot but it's perhaps not 
you know, you perhaps you need something a little bit longer, don't you, in the, in the focal length range to get that really shallow depth of field and also to what well, we'll come on to sort of out of focus elements as well, uh, you know, as we go through the live. But you've got a bigger glass element on that on the front of that 180 macro, haven't you? Then well, I'll show people yeah. that the standard macro lens is kind of, you know, it's quite a small piece of glass, isn't it? So yeah. getting getting it's about 58 mil, I think, on, yeah, the, on a normal like macro. That. So putting things in front of it, you haven't got a lot of space. You haven't got all the glass to put things in front of. Whereas if you're my standard go to lens now for photographing flowers, believe it or not, you probably can't get this in. But is the two to five hundred, um, which I normally use for, for bird photography. But look, hang on, I've got the, but look at the real estate on the end of that. You know, on the you know on the end of that lens, there's plenty of room to put things in front of, and that's that's what you're doing yeah. with, with that 180, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah good, I mean, when know. I when I swapped using the 180, my photography just went completely in a different direction and up numerous levels because it just opened so many more doors creatively for me compared to using the the 100. Yeah, so if you you know if 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 people out there haven't got the, uh, a 180 macro and don't want to invest in it, you know, at this stage, um, then why not try? You know, particularly with some of the larger plants, it's more difficult with the smaller subjects. But with bluebells in particular, I, uh, you know, I use the two to five hundred, and I open it right up at five point six. And at five hundred mil, you know, you're getting a nice shallow depth of field even at five point six. So give that a go. I know there's a couple of people that you know that certainly in the um, in the wild art Facebook group that have been trying it um, and have been coming up with some really nice stuff actually. But have in a go. In, re in recent years, um because of obviously we have to protect our bluebell woodlands anyway you don't want to be trampling the flowers and sticking to the path i've not really been able to create the images with a 180 i've used a uh, 150 to 600 mil lens yeah near enough at the 600 mil to create really beautiful abstract works of art yeah. with a zoom lens because i'm actually mm -hmm. shooting something that's that far away it doesn't really matter yeah, and, I, and I'm assuming that a lot of people that are watching this, actually because they're wildlife photographers, will have a lens in their kit bag of that sort of ilk anyway. So give that give that a go. Seriously, put that long lens on your camera and go and shoot some flowers next spring, and you'll be surprised, I think. That, that, you know, open the aperture up. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll go and we'll talk about some more of these techniques. But a couple more people coming in and saying hello. So Alan James is on. He says, hi, Robin Vic. Hi, Alan. And Susie Crow's on as well, saying afternoon, Robin Vic. So hello to, to both of you. And uh, I hope you're, you're both doing well. OK, let's move on to the next image. And we were talking about conditions. And this is a pretty unique set of conditions you know, when you when you took this, you've done really well with the, this set of images, haven't you? Yeah. yeah, this is probably an image that I am best known for by far. Um, there's again, it's another one I visited the site maybe four or five times now. I've never been able to recreate anything that can even touch this image. So when people say there is an element of luck into wildlife and nature photography, there really is. Um, mm. Now. The, what I should probably say as well is like for this image, it's not about, you know, looking at the weather forecast in the morning when we get up and deciding it's a good day to go. I was actually looking at the weather forecast for a week to 10 days before I picked the right day to go. And that's looking at like what the overnight temperature would be, the dew point, it, what the morning is going to be. Is it going to be slightly misty? Is it going to be blue skies and sunny? Is it going to rain? Um, and I, I would then pick the best day based on the weather forecast. And I yeah. would even even like for this one, I was up at three o'clock in the morning to get myself sorted, drive to the site. It's about probably about an hour, an hour and 20 away from from home yeah. in Somerset. Um, and then I would get there. It's then a good half an hour, 40 minute walk from the car park to the site um, along a road. So you have to factor all that in. And I wanted to be there for a certain time. But even at three o'clock in the morning when I got up, I still check the forecast because it can change overnight. I mean, we all know what the forecasting is like in the UK anyway. <laughs> <laughs> unpredictable. <laughs> Very unpredictable. And uh, uh, Except yeah. at the moment where it's just heat and sunshine. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think that pretty much sums up Europe, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I got there and it was just, I couldn't have asked for better conditions. It was a very, very heavy dew. Not only that, it was 
there was there was a really nice kind of low mist as well, which meant when the sun came up, it wasn't bright mm. sunshine. It was completely diffused by the mist, which meant you know photographing white flowers and you know the the heavy dew conditions meant I didn't get any blown out whites. Yeah. And the other no, thing as well, it, it's finding two flowers that are in that position. The, these are all wild flowers. They're, they're taken in the wild. I don't garden around them. Um, you know, so this is basically, this is me very carefully laying in the grass to get the right angle and everything that I need. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very rare situation, this. And, and as you say, it's finding the right plants to photograph. It's a, mm. it's a real skill because you, I mean, how long, what's the window where for, for these conditions to last when you're there and with the lighting mm. conditions and everything that you've got? It's pretty small. You've maybe got five, 10 minutes of that. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been in that situation, as you know, two years ago, we, we, we talked about this and I had frost and I think people have seen some of my images and, and it was Victoria that inspired me to photograph the plants in in this book because it fritillaries again snakes have fritillaries again uh and i've got a site which is 45 minutes away from me which is very quiet it's not well known um you know it's not a it's not the sort of classic cricklade meadows uh, on the thames which just you know there are hordes of people go to see those it's spectacular but there are too many people around for my liking and uh, but i've got a very very quiet site not too far from me which is you know again it has, has a really heavy dew in the morning because it's right next to the river so you can almost guarantee that it'll at least have some sort of dew forming on them. But this morning it was frosty. But as you say, you've got 10 minutes. And as soon as that sun hits the plants, it's melting that frost straight away because it's so delicate. Uh, no, it, and, and almost, I don't know about you, but I get I almost get into a panic <laughs> because <it's>, um, <laughs> you probably don't. You're cool and no. collected. Yeah. Uh. No, I think I, I don't when I'm doing stuff like this. But the thing with this one as well, and, and as people that know this image and they've seen the image, you know there's actually a rainbow underneath those flowers yeah. as well. Yeah. And, yes. again, it's having exactly the right – that here. rainbow is not Photoshopped in. That is – that was – I didn't see that until I was actually processing the image, but it was there and it was as a result of the perfect conditions on that morning. Yeah, exactly. And you're, you've never had these again. I've never had that condition again. I no. I cannot recreate my own image. No. So. I've, I've tried to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, when you get an image like that, you know yeah. that it, it is, this this image changed my life photographically. It, it changed a lot of things for me. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah. when you get an image like that, I still love this image. I, I don't tend to include it in any of my talks or anything anymore because I've probably shared it to death and people probably don't want to see it anymore. But, you know, I still love this image. Yeah. And it's, it's that sort of lovely bokeh as well, isn't it? Which um, yeah. if you've got dew forming in the morning and it's backlit by the sun and you've got a wide open aperture and a long lens, the bokeh that you're going to get. I mean, bokeh is an unpredictable thing. But I think in these circumstances, you can absolutely guarantee you're going to get something, yeah. a really beautiful effect. But, uh, yeah, so I love using dew in the morning in grasses backlit to create bokeh for all sorts of things so a couple of comments coming in so Susie Crow says uh, it's also pure dedication to your photography to get these results yeah it's not a question of you roll out of bed in the morning and go oh what am I going to photograph today oh I, I fancy photographing snakes head fritillaries oh boom there you go it's it's planning so much planning mm -hmm. goes into this uh, Probably, Rachel, I think go on, sorry I was just going to say if, if you take if you take an image and you divide it up into percentage probably at least 70 to 75 percent of an image for me is research and planning it's done in my office at home it's not done out in the field yeah, yeah but then it means that's... when i get there you know i come away more often than not with images that i'm very happy with and have a very successful yeah. hour couple of hours day whatever yeah, but it's like a sports person, isn't it? I mean, you know, okay, so they play football for 90 minutes on a Saturday afternoon, but it's not that's not the only time they go to work. <laughs> you know, no. it's the dedication, all the training and the practice uh, that, you, that they do during the week that you don't see that gets them to no. that point. You know, yeah. And, so that's, and, and again, it's very, very similar in, in photography if you're really serious about it and, and want to, you know, in, improve your techniques, and improve your results. You know, it's, it's it's planning it's planning those images to get the right conditions. I mean, it's similarly to the bluebells. Okay, so a couple more comments. Um, 
Rachel Piper says, beautiful, so delicate and subtle. And I think that that sort of sums this image up altogether. Uh, and Jane O'Connor says, I love the delicacy and the way the dew seems to be just dripping out of the flower head on the right. Uh, and Michael Snedek, such a beautiful mood with this image. I mean, it is a gorgeous image. And when I saw it, I said, I, I just knew, I thought, I want to be able to take things like this. I, you know, this is the direction I want my own photography to go. Because I'll show you how I used to take flowers uh, a little later on. We'll get onto that. But uh, let's let's move on. As nice as this is, this is something a little different. So it's a different technique. Um, talk people through this one, Vic. Um, so this is another. This site actually isn't too far from where I took the snakes and fritillary. And actually, the two. This is a pasque flower. It's a wild pasque flower. Mm. And the two generally flower around, around about the same time of the year. So if you've got two sites relatively close, it's great because you can go and spend a couple of days and get both um, at the same time. Um, but, yeah, th this is like in complete contrast to the, the previous image. The one thing I wanted to do, the one thing I love about past flowers is it's their hairiness. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. That's, and when the light comes through them, you can kind of get this beautiful rim lighting. This is all done with natural lights. There's no artificial light in this one at all. And it is just the sun coming up over the hill. So these particular past flowers are on a hillside. You know, again, research. I knew the sun was going to come up behind the hill and point down the hill towards where the past flowers were. So I knew that if I could get myself in a position, when that sun started to come up, I could get the backlighting on the flower to get that little bit coming through the petals. And it's so the majority of my work is also done in camera, um, as a lot of people that know me will, will know that I'm, I'm very I'm a big advocate for. And I will push the contrast slider up in camera. And then oh, sorry, I will... but, <laughs> guys, <laughs> guys barking if, if, <laughs> if people didn't realize. So there's some, there's some kids shouting outside. So that's what she's barking um, at. Sorry. <laughs> and then I'll actually I'll spot meter on one of the lightest areas because that actually then helps to throw out my background. Yeah. And because of the way the sun's coming down, it's kind of coming directly to, onto the flower, but I've actually still got some of the background um, in shadow and then it's underexposed to get yeah. to this point. Yeah, this this is a sort of technique that I've, I've talked about before. And, I, you know, I think it's really useful. I photograph bluebells this way, actually. Um, and and it was quite successful in, in quite harsh summer light. And I thought, oh, you know me, I'm always looking for things to photograph, even when conditions aren't favorable. And uh, and I just thought, oh, I know it's a bit harsh, but if I really underexpose it and I position the background so the background's in, you know, I put them in a, you know, in front of a shaded background, um, then it might work. And it did actually in a very, very, so, I mean, not as good as this, but it, it worked in a similar way. And it's, it's, it's understanding the difference in exposure levels and how light works and how you can manipulate it to create something and how you can control your camera and tell it what you want it to take, then that's how, you know, you're able, then able to start creating, you know, this type of image. So it's completely different to your fritillaries, but. And I, so I think that you've kind of hit the nail on the head, knowing your equipment. I, if yeah. I use either my 5D or my 7D and my 180, I know exactly where all the buttons are. I know exactly, you know, where I need to change things without even looking at it. Now, there might be different when I can hopefully get back to photography next year. I'm going to have to kind of re-familiarize myself with it. But by knowing exactly where everything is, where you don't have to take the camera away, look at it and try and fiddle around with it and then get back to it. You actually, you can concentrate on composing and actually capturing the image, not faffing around with your settings. Yeah. And then people people might say, well, it's, it's only a flower. It doesn't run or fly away. What's the problem? But the thing is, sometimes you get lighting conditions that are fleeting. I mean, imagine that you, you have um, a pretty cloudy day and you get one little spot of sunshine, which lasts maybe five seconds. If you're faffing around with the back of the camera going, oh, I need to change my settings and uh, where, you've missed it. You know, so yeah. even with this type of photography, and we were saying, a, uh, you know, a little bit earlier about the fritillaries, and you've got that ten-minute window of really good light. You don't want to be messing around with your camera settings. You want to be finding compositions. You want to be shooting yeah. things. Uh, and you've probably you know. got even less to get a photo like this because you need the light intensity to be just right. The moment yeah. the sun's too high in the sky, forget it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is why I picked this image out because I thought it'd be an interesting one to talk about. Okay. 
what have you got so that again this is a different technique so we were talking about you know intentional camera movement and i'm guessing that this is one of those uh, images now this is sort of wild garlic or ramsons um so so talk us talk us through i love photographing ramsons oh i came um, across a I just, wonderful site this year but anyway th this is actually the this is the woodlands behind the house where we where we live at home there's beautiful bluebell woodland but also full of wild garlic and, and other flowers and stuff and I just thought you see so many images of it. I thought, what could I do that's slightly different? And I, I basically went out and I had a play. You know, I tried to do some intentional camera movement with the bluebells, but because of the way the woodland is, it didn't really work. So I thought, well, do you know what? I'm, I've got an afternoon. I'm just going to have a play and see what happens. And that's what I did with this one. I just, it's not moved in one direction. It's kind of wiggled a little bit. Yeah. So you get this kind of almost like abstract painted feel. Um, to the image and again on the slightly kind of cooler side with the white balance as well yeah no i mean I, you know i i like it because it's 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 just a different approach and this is what we were saying earlier about you know if we're talking about competition images is doing something a little different i know that you know icm or intentional camera movement it's not a new technique i mean you know we we, we all we all know about it and i said most of the images don't work but when you get one that does it's you know, it, it you know it can it can be yeah. you know, a real real sort of jaw dropper, but uh, no, it's just it's thinking about things a little differently and experimenting and just you know if if you never do anything differently and you always have the same approach, how are you ever going to end up with anything that is different, you know, or and more yeah. unusual than your your normal image? And I, it it costs nothing. I mean, once you've got the equipment, digital photography costs nothing. Um, and yeah. it's it's fun to experiment and play because you may actually stumble across something you think do you know what there's an idea in here i can keep working at it and i think you know i like this idea i like this technique yeah. and again with this one it, you know i've always say about changing settings in camera i've taken the contrast right down in this one as well so yeah. you've got that lovely softness to it as well yeah sort of painterly feel almost is you know yeah. with a lot of your images you you get this sort of painterly feel which i think is a real you know if you're talking about art in photography you know it's it's quite a good direction to go in or to try because it does create these sort of different different moods and feels and i, I just think you yeah. know photography is all about experimentation for me um and if you and this is what these sort of live events are about is sort of sharing other people's photography and their ideas and then hopefully sparking some sort of um some sort of uh you know idea uh, or in, you know, inspiring people to go out and try something a little different, and, and perhaps sort of move their not not move their photography on, but I think that's that's a bit patronising to say that, but to give them you know perhaps another string to their photographic bow, you know, and then they can yeah, use I, different yeah. techniques. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think as well for me, it, it's about expression. You know, I I mean, ultimately, I'm a scientist first and foremost, but I love my art and. I love being able to express myself and have that individuality in my work. Um, and okay, at the moment I'm, I'm not doing any photography, but where I've concentrated more on my actual artwork of drawing and stuff over the last year, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how that then influences my photography yeah. next yeah. year. I mean, if, if people don't know, as well as being a, an ace photographer, Victoria's sickeningly good at, um, at drawing as well. <laughs> Something that I can't do. But, uh, anyway, <laughs> got another comment coming in from Wendy Turkington. Hi, Wendy. Um, she says, hi, Rob and Sky and Victoria. First time I've watched and amazed by the photographs and techniques used. So thank you for that. And I'll see you dog walking sometime, no doubt. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, let's move on and let's uh, see what we've got next. Oh, this is one of your one of your favorite subjects. Isn't mm. it? And was this taken in the last year or two? I'm, I, I think wasn't it? No, um, it was actually one of the taken. Older ones? This was taken probably about six or seven years ago. Oh right, okay. I thought it was the one in your garden. No, no, no. That this is this is one that grows alongside a very busy dual carriageway. Yeah, it, really good places for orchids. Actually, it's a real tip for yeah. people. If you're driving, I mean, I'm, I, well, when I'm a passenger, I'm always looking at the verges when we're driving along roads like the 303, which goes through a lot of chalk downland. And because they're undisturbed, 
because people don't obviously people don't stop and uh, and and walk uh, you know over those areas and they're not they're not um, they're not grazed so much. It's a really good place for for orchids um, of all sorts of all species. Yes, yeah, so have a good look. You know, uh, in the sort of late spring uh, along the roadsides. Anyway, sorry, I was interrupting. <laughs> this one's actually it's a fly bee uh, natural hybrid. So I'm pretty sure most people who follow me will know that I've had. I photographed my bee orchid to death two years ago um, in my front garden. Yeah. Uh, but this is actually the hybrid with the fly orchid. And I wanted to go down and see it. And actually, I mean, it, it's had some very up and down years. And I think the hedgerow that you can see in the background is much fuller and it, it's much more dense now. So mm -hmm. they recently replaced the hedgerow when I actually took this photo. So it meant there were a lot of gaps in it. And it, so I used one of those gaps to kind of position myself so that I had the light coming through the gap to kind of frame the, the orchid itself. But then I just used all the other foliage growing around it to kind of finish that frame. So you're kind yeah. of drawn in, but it's also, you've got a bit of that in habitat. So you can see snippets of the other plants that are growing alongside it. And again, yeah. slightly on the cooler side, um, it's actually slightly overexposed, maybe by about a third or possibly two thirds. But, you know, contrast down as well, just to kind of soften it and again, give it that more kind of painted mm. artwork feel. See, I, this is one of those images. But I wanted to show this because it's a really good example of putting elements in front of the lens. Uh, and it's probably one of those plants that most people would look at and go, do you know what? This is too, there's too much clutter around this plant to to be able to do anything with it and they would maybe walk past it but you've used that sort of um those sort of out of focus or those those elements and put thrown them out of focus and given it some context sorry i've got if you can hear something in the background it's because one of my neighbors has started up a um some sort of some sort of engine <laughs> so apologies for if, if there's any background noise i've got all the windows open because it's so hot <laughs> Um, but uh, anyway, yeah. So it's it's one of those it's one of those images images that um, you've made use presumably of the 180 macro lens and all that real estate you've got in front of you know you know in that sort of glass element in the front to put all sorts of things um, out of focus to, to to give it that frame. Yeah. So the minimum focusing distance is about 30 centimeters for the 180. And the trick is to, if that's the end of your lens, based, some of these plants are within a centimetre or a couple of centimetres of the front of the lens. So they're yeah. going to be out of focus, but they create this kind of lovely soft blur. And it gives you that feeling of actually looking through, you know, to the orchid. So you're, you're actually having to kind of, I guess what I'm trying to do is, is recreate that moment that I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm looking through this foliage to that orchid, which is how you would see it in the wild. You yeah. wouldn't see it completely perfectly on its own with a completely plain background nothing in the foreground that that's not how they grow um so it's a truer representation and it's it's like a whole picture rather than just being the subject on its own isolated. so it's telling a, it's telling a story of the species as well as being a really artistic yeah. interpretation on on you know on the scene uh, and it's i think you know your comment about positioning yourself and positioning yourself so you, that sort of gap of brighter sunlight um, is behind the plant is really important it's not just about looking at the subject it's about looking at the the backgrounds and uh, you know and and what's in the background and the foreground and piecing an image together using all those elements you know and not just the concentration on the one thing and that's what i think makes photographers like you stand out from other other people that that haven't yet got to grips with thinking about all of those elements at the same time it's it's rather like um i guess learning to play a musical instrument you know you learn the sort of basic chords of a guitar for example but you don't learn the sort of more intricate nuances of it until you get more experienced and i think you know it's the same with with photography this isn't the basic chord this is a more complicated sequence of notes uh, all strung together and i think that's you know that's the difference and that's i think the whole point of some of these lives is to try and uh basically get people to start piecing these things together and and getting them to appreciate what makes some images stand out of, over others and and the work that has to go into actually creating them it's not just a question of going out with a camera and snap there you go you know victoria hillman does it mm -hmm. again 
it, it, yeah, there, really there's works. an awful lot of work that goes in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. A couple of comments coming in again. Um, Kuram Khan's on. Hi, Kuram. Uh, he says, hi, guys. Uh, Jane O'Connor says, this is pure fairy tale. It looks as though it's guarding the entrance to a, a misty secret garden. Uh, there should be a story with it. Well, knowing your talents, Vic, I'm sure you, you know, you'd know you be pretty good at uh, fiction writing as well. Well, maybe not. <laughs> I'm sure you would. Uh, Rachel Piper says, when do you think you'll be back to taking photographs, uh, Victoria? Uh, your coloured pencil work um, has blown me away this year, so I'm pleased that you've been able to express your creativity. Oh, thank you so much. Um, at the moment, I probably won't even think about um, picking up my camera again, really, until next year, sadly. Yeah. Um, well, we yeah let, let, yeah it's it's been a it's been a difficult time for you I know so let's not dwell on it too much but um, yeah let's let's I'm sure everybody hopes you get back including me particularly hopes you get back to uh, to, to it, it, it will be hope. baby steps and it, it's been factored into my rehab um, yeah. the important thing is that we don't rush it so for now I'm just concentrating on the stuff I can do so my needle felting hopefully I'll be able to go back to my drawing soon uh, this image is actually on my to draw list yeah. um so we shall see um, rachel also asks do you ever draw on your computer i purchased coral painter recently and it's made me realize how much i have learned about light from photography and drawing i love using the tablet um no <laughs> because i actually hate working on my computer <laughs> yeah it's, it, you, do, you don't um, find it terribly easy with with you know with, with the issue that you've got do you so it's... no and actually um right now I, I can't work at my computer i'm actually doing this on, on my phone mainly because my laptop decided it didn't want to play ball but yeah i, um... I lost which is why we're a minute or two late i lost vic's feed <laughs> just as we were um, about yeah. to go live, my, my laptop so. decided it didn't want to play ball today so i'm doing it on my phone uh, yeah. but yeah i i actually working at the computer is, is pretty much a no-go for me right now and i'd actually much rather um, just either sit outside or by a window and yeah, just work through just with, with my pencils and a piece of paper. Yeah. Good. Talking about positioning yourself against backgrounds and using foreground elements and that sort of thing. Talk people through this because this isn't an easy thing to do. No. So these, um, these are, again, this is the woodland behind my house at home. We have a few areas of, sn of snowdrops growing wild down there and this was it was another one of those days we had all this rain for a couple of days and then the sun I was actually out for a walk and I took my camera anyway and this I'd gone down to check to see if the snowdrops were up yet and the sun was just coming out and it was just this most gorgeous after rain light buttery sunshine that was coming through so everything was wet so you get this this kind of lovely Boker, and you know, I found a few, a uh, few snowdrops just starting to come up, and these ones were, I mean, they're very low to the ground, so I'm, I'm pretty much my camera is, is embedded in pretty much more or less in the ground, yeah. trying to get the angle on these, and then I've just that white circle behind the snowdrops is actually just a water droplet in the distance, um, that the light's hitting. Um, that, that's actually what it is. But when I saw that, when I was looking through the camera, I was like, well, actually, if I angle myself just right, I can kind of get one snowdrop here and one coming out the top and have it behind those snowdrops. Yeah. And those those sort of shapes you've got uh, across that bokeh ball, they're, out of, they're sort of elements in front of the lens? Yeah. So some of them are actually um, elements that are really close in and in, in front of the lens. Some of it you get like these weird. So sometimes if you've got big area, like big kind of bokeh balls, you've you can get some areas that are almost, I guess it's not quite reflected, but like shadowed into the, mm. into the water droplet. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. Some of the shapes and things that I've seen in some images and you get, Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's really cool to see not only the bokeh, but you've got interest in the bokeh balls themselves. I think there were, mm. there are a few there frog images like that, that we had was it last year or it might even been this year, where there were some quite interesting shapes in the actual bokeh. You know, which yeah. uh, it was was the frog spawn actually was out of focus. Frog spawn catching, you know, early morning light or something like that, and, it, and creating all this bokeh. But there were some interesting shapes. Whatever somebody had thrown in, out of focus in the foreground. So uh, yeah, have a, have a good play around with that sort of thing. I mean, whenever you've got dew, and early morning sunlight, 
that's a really good recipe for creating uh, bokeh. And you can do all sorts of things with it. But not only do you, you can use also things like, uh, I, I did this with a um, greater butterfly orchid last year, was I used the light coming in through the leaves uh, on a tree. So wherever you've got sort of small sort of points of light against a dark background, which you can throw really out of focus, that's when you get this sort of bokeh created. And that's how I create it. In fact, um, on some of the other intro slides if somebody watched some of the other videos uh, that image actually is used in the intro um with lots of bokeh yeah anyway and, and so, the key is a wide aperture the yeah. wider the aperture the softer um and more appealing the bokeh will be yeah exactly okay let's see what's next and again this is an, uh, this is using a slightly different technique so i'm guessing you're underexposing here again yeah and th this does actually have a little light this has got additional light used in it. I don't use flash with any of my work. It's a little LED light on the ground pointing directly up into that open snowdrop. The snowdrops themselves are actually growing wild, but they're in a really kind of shady area um, in a little valley in amongst some ruins. And in the afternoon, it's, there's no, even on a sunny day, it, it's just dark. And when I saw this one kind of open up and I, I just, like we said earlier, about having a play, just experimenting. And I just thought, what if I got my little light out, put it under this one flower and see what happens? And it took me a while to get the image I actually wanted um, with this. But the moment I kind of, I first saw that first image on the back of the camera, I actually knew that mm. there was something in here. And again, I it's metered for the white part on the flower. So it throws out out the background but you just pick up that little hint of highlight into the other snowdrops as well yeah they're, they're like little lanterns aren't they so you know yeah. uh, the, the theme about your photography that i really like is that it's always so delicate you know it's always so delicate and beautiful um but there are a number of different techniques that you use but the overall feel of it is is just delicacy and beauty and that's you know that's what really comes across i think and and you, you know your approach is quite delicate to yeah it. yeah i think uh, for me like nature is although it's resilient and it's robust it is also delicate and i just want to show i want to kind of show how i see and feel what it is that i'm photographing yeah absolutely. which is not you know i'm not gonna lie it's not easy to do it's it, it can be very scary when you when you are trying to find your own style um, and then you start putting it out there for the world to see. It can be really scary, especially if it's different. But I, I, I in fact, I've just written a, an article for Birdwatching magazine because um, I, I, you know, I, do, I have a fairly regular feature in in there. And, and this is and I wrote a piece about because I had lots of conversations with people at Bird Fair, actually, and they would come up to me and they would look at the images in the book and they would look at some of my own work on display. And in fact, I took some of your work as well and displayed that at Bird Fair too. And they would come up to me and they would talk about it and they would say, well, I, you know, I can't compete, you know, with, with this sort of standard. This is just way beyond, you know, what I could do with my limited gear, which is another subject, actually. I don't think people should be limited by the gear that they've got or haven't got um, because I just think a lot of that is complete nonsense too. But, um, and then I, the question was, well, actually, do you enjoy what you do? Do you enjoy the photographs that you take? Do you get pleasure from, from, you know, from it? And if the answer to that is yes, then what does it matter? Why do you, you don't have to compete necessarily. Not everything's a competition. I know this is all about a photography competition, <laughs> but life isn't, isn't, you know, all competitive. It's about enjoyment. And, and that's but what I, I hope I mean. Whatever yeah. level you, you photograph at, you should be doing it for you from the heart anyway. Exactly. Um, like even I, I don't enter competitions really anymore, especially not at the moment. Uh, but anything I have entered into competitions in the past, it's been stuff that I've shot. This, this was en entered into a competition. Um, I actually won the Shepton Mallet Snowdrop co competition a few years ago. And then they stopped me from entering until, and I started judging <laughs> instead. Um, but they, you know, I think if you can shoot from the heart and then have the confidence to enter into a competition, the judges will notice a difference because yeah. that there is a definite difference there from people that photograph 
purely for competitions and purely for the the judge that might be judging it or you know they 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 shoot not necessarily from the heart but specifically for competitions and then you get somebody that has entered an image that's been shot from the heart it's what they love Mm -hmm. but they've entered it into a competition you notice the difference because you get feeling in that image do you know i think that's such a that that that's really, as you well, you said it earlier, sort of hitting the nail on the head in terms of what I was trying to get over in this article. It's, it's like if you photograph what you love and you photograph it in the way you love doing it, that comes across in the image. And if you love it, who cares what other people think? I've long since stop bothering what people think about my photography on social media for example i know that sounds a bit strange coming from somebody that runs photography competitions and i had all this pressure on me to create images that that perhaps would compete with some of the competition winners well you know there are so many people taking so many wonderful pictures how you know how have i got the arrogance to think that i could compete with with you know so many other people out there and why would i even why, why would i even bother i do it because i love it and, and listen, I, I think yeah. photography is an art. First, you know, it's just another expression of art, just like drawing or painting um, or sculpting. It's all mm. art. So there is no right or wrong. Yeah. Well, you can see you love photographing snowdrops. <laughs> it's one of your favorites. I have a bit of an obsession with snowdrops. <laughs> yeah. But I included this image because it's, you know, this is another technique that we can talk True. about. Um, and it actually is, you know, a technique which we allow in abstracts. Um, and that this is a double exposure, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. Um, and there's, a, there's another slide after this which shows the two images, I think, uh, and, and the final image. Is that correct? I've, I think I've, yes. I've got that right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. yeah so this, this is actually um, this is actually a multiple exposure. It's two images. Um, it might, if you put the other slide up, Rob, then I can kind yeah. of explain yeah. uh, okay. the two. So, this is basically the two smaller images you can see. They're my two exposures that are then added together. Now, all my multiple exposure work is done in camera. It's not done on the computer um, because even without injuries and surgery and everything else, I still hate working at my computer. Um, I'd much rather be outside, you know, taking pictures or, or doing whatever, to be honest. Um, but what I for this one, what I've done is I've taken one in focus and one out of focus. Now, a trick that I learned with doing the multiple exposures, and it works for my camera, so this was shot on a 5D. When I take the first one, it will stay, I use live view, and it will actually stay on the screen. That then allows me to overlay the second one so that I can see exactly that final image that I'm gonna create before I take that second picture. Yeah. And what it did, it basically took my hit rate from about 3% to about 95%. Because wow. I just composed it on the live view and I knew exactly what my image was going to look like when it was added together. Yeah. So it wasn't a bit of a hit and hope and see what happens, which is how it started. You're actually composing it. Yeah, you're actually composing yeah. it on the back of the camera. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and, I mean, if people have played around with this technique, then I think that they will know that it's a bit like that sort of intentional camera movement stuff that a, that a lot of the things you take, you're just going to throw away because they don't work. Mm. But when you get one that does, it's, it's, it's brilliant. But if you've got that ability to be able to compose it, as you've been describing, well, as you say, your hit rate is, is, is bound to get much better because you can actually see what you're getting. Yeah. I mean, I, I only use two. I've, I've done a few in the past where I've used three or four, but two is, is my favorite because yeah. I think otherwise it can get a bit messy. Um, but it's then just so I've got like the one, the snowdrops are obviously in focus. And then I've used, I've put the camera to manual focus and deliberately got that really blurry out of focus mm. of a group of snowdrops to then overlay on top of um, these snowdrops. Now, the other thing is that like, you'll notice the the final image is actually lighter than the original two images. Mm. Um, a little tip is to actually slight is to underexpose the two images because when you're adding them together, um, and these are they are added together, they're additive. Um, your image will be lighter than the original file. So if you if you overexpose your original files, uh, your your two that you're going to add together, your final one is going to be you're almost doubling up on that yeah okay that's that's a useful in fact that's something i didn't know so there you go 
You've taught me something. Well, you've taught me a lot anyway over the years, <laughs> but you, you just taught me something new. But also <laughs> having don't use like a, a warm, a warmer white balance, use a cooler white balance again because you're adding it together. You can see neither mm. of those those files are actually particularly warm. They're actually quite dull and quite um, quite cool, but when you add it together, you get that warmth coming through. Yeah. Well, wow. so you need no, it's you need to an incredible it, thing. Yeah, uh, err on uh, the side of of dull and darkness, and then your finished image will be better. Yeah, but honestly, it's it's a really uh, great thing to have a uh, to to experiment with, and I haven't done it anywhere near enough. I mean, we had a great day. What is it? Almost a couple of years ago, wasn't it? We went to the was, Arboretum, yeah. Western Burton. We you know we had mm. a day doing doing this, and you were you, you were you were you were instructing me on on how to do it and because uh, you know I just something I'd never done before but I haven't really done it since then and it's it's one of those things that I really must get to grips with because some of the results are amazing I always remember I think it was Daniel Trim who took that image of the gannets that um, he entered yeah. into bird photographer of the year one year yeah, where he took a done. close up of a gannet's head and then he took the gannet colony and he blended those two images together mm. and it, it was it, it that that image stuck with me so yeah it was Daniel wasn't it that, that took it was that, Daniel yeah. yeah 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 okay no, excellent so that's, but what, that's basically... one thing you, you were saying about the equipment earlier, like that day that we had at Westenburg, because you had your main camera equipment. Yeah. I was using a little compact camera and I can do this on my little compact camera. Yeah. So it, you don't need this sort of big DSLR kit no. or this or the or the mirrorless as everybody's using these days. I said, I am going to do a video when I get around to it, and when I get the time about GAS, which is an acronym, which is Gear Acquisition Syndrome. I think we've all got a bit of that. <laughs> anyway, enough said about that. And uh, so that's the last slide. What I thought I would do is I would, because I know we're, we're up to an hour now, and I know you didn't really want to do more more than an hour, because, you, you, yeah, you, you get a little uncomfortable. Um, well, it's, not, it's not so bad because I'm now not using my computer. I can sit back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me, let, me just, let me just stop sharing that screen a second, get some more images up. Um, because I just wanted to show people basically how what I've seen Victoria do and her approach to photography has changed what I take. Um, so that actually this isn't in the right order, but we'll, we'll go for it anyway. So let me just share this one to start with. All right, okay. So this is how I used to take, and I still do, I still take images like this because sometimes I write about things and it's good to have a sort of literal representation of a species um, so people can identify it and they know what I'm talking about. So that's, you know, that's how I used to take uh, my flower images. And let me just cycle back through and get to the, uh, just go, right, okay. So talking about snake's head fritillaries and amazing conditions, um, this was this was my, you know, it was the same sort of experience that you had with your fritillaries. Uh, was in a local, well, you know, forty five minutes away from me. Knew what the weather conditions were going to do. The likelihood of a frost, and I thought, right, I'm going to get down there. Uh, and and we had these just most incredible conditions. This really light hoar frost, which made these beautiful ice crystals. Which is ne I've never seen this before. I don't know whether I'll ever see it again. But as soon as that sun hit those that I you know that frost, it was melting straight away. So I had like literally two minutes, two minutes to take something. And again, I've overexposed this. But this is your this is your influence in my own photography. This is picking up things that you've done and incorporating it into my own photography, moving it away from the you know from the common spotted orchid that I've just shown into into approaching it with more this type of uh, style and again i was with you when i took this yeah if you remember <laughs> at, uh, I do. That at clay, was last year, wasn't it? clay it was last year yeah at clay hill and again slightly slightly different i just saw all these sort of i think it's quaker grass isn't it this, this it stuff is, here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and i just saw these sort of lovely seed heads and thought oh they look, make nice out of focus shapes and whatever and uh, went for the shallow depth of field all this in the in front um, of the lens is just out of focus grass just create a nice soft feel so you know again you know it's the hillman approach um, and with snowdrops and this is a single exposure this isn't a multiple exposure kind of looks like it but it yeah, i assure you it isn't it's just loads of out of focus um plants in front of it. in fact i did a, a video on photographing snowdrops uh, where i showed people 
you know, what I was doing when I was taking, in fact, I was probably taking um, one of these images. But uh, it's just, if you, most people don't want things in front of the lens. You know, they want to get a clear shot. But seriously, play around with just deliberately putting plants in front of the lens and moving it around, looking through the viewfinder or looking on your screen. And sometimes, you know, the subject flower will just sort of kind of pop out through a little gap and everything else is really soft and you get all these lovely out of focus shapes. I mean, this is another snowdrop here, which is completely out of focus. These are all sort of leaves and blades of grass, that sort of thing, just creating this sort of soft feel. So, uh, and again, this is shot through moss, actually. It was a load of sort of dried moss, which I, which I just found a little hole through and photographed this lesser celandine. And this is in bright sunshine, actually. So I'm underexposing this image and just creating you know, a nice soft frame for it. All your attention's on the flower. Uh, and it's then nice, got a nice contrast in, you know, in exposure and color. And I think, I think one of the things is as well, like you kind of like touched on it there. It's take your time. Don't, don't feel you need to rush. Like you said, look for these little gaps, actually take your time to, to look for that oh. composition before you take the picture. Yeah. And this was something I took this spring. You know, and again, I, I spent ages trying to sort of work this one out. As you were saying before, it's looking for the right plant, isn't it? And this one was standing yeah. proud of proud of the group, but it's trying to find something that works and it's balanced. And again, I've got loads of bluebells right in front of the lens. I mean, they're touching the lens almost uh, to, to create this, this frame and create this softness. And in fact, there are bluebells in front of my subject bluebell to just create the color wash. That I've, that I've got there so you know have a go just play around I mean you know you don't have to use this style but why not take things from you know what we've been discussing today and just just give it a go uh, and just try and say, take something a little different so anyway so that's how that's how you you know you've chat oh and there, there you go I told you I like taking ramsons um, and then again this is using um, a lower angle and this is the sky coming through um, sort of uh, gaps in the trees uh, and, and these sort of shapes are just out of focus you know, uh, plants that are, that are creating those sort of shadow type effects um, yeah and again so back to back to where I was so from there to here and it's not difficult you know you can make these changes you can experiment with this stuff um, you know to create this this sort of thing so let me just stop sharing that let's catch up with a final few comments uh, and then we'll let you we'll let you go and relax and enjoy the rest of your day, Vic. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, Rachel, oh, we've dealt with that one. Uh, Susie Crow says, hopefully you'll get back to your camera in time for the dragonfly roost. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed, because you you know you, we're going to have to have another go at that. Yeah. And After we will these go. failed roots last year. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I didn't try this year. I just things just ran yeah. away with me, and I didn't didn't. Anyway, it's no fun without you, Vic. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so hopefully we can have a we can have a go at that next year. Well, um, actually, one one thing that although I I can't do it, and I I'm not going to force getting back to my photography. I will get back to it as and when I'm able, because if I yeah. force it, I'll get frustrated. But I think what will happen is when I go back to it with what I'm doing with my artwork, I'll probably be photographing more for me to then potentially create artwork out of it. So I think actually my photography is probably going to change dramatically once I do actually return to it next year. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, we are, we're, you know, as photographers, as I said, we're always developing. We're always, we're iterations of ourselves really, aren't we? You know, there's always the next phase. And you think about, you know, famous artists, they all go through phases, don't they? And why should that be any different for us yeah. as photographers? Um, I think know, we all go through those, those those periods, don't we, where we have no inspiration. We have no, and the problem is, like, the, you'll get two types of people when you go through that that let's call it a inspirational mist phase, where you just can't see anything. You don't feel like doing anything. You'll get people that will push through, and people will say, "Okay, do you know what? It's not working. I'm going to put it down to one side. I'm going to do something different for a while, and I'm going to come back to it when I'm ready." Yeah. That second group of people are more likely to come back to it with renewed enthusiasm and inspiration mm -hmm. than people that try to push and plow through it. You've got to, you know, if you love what you're doing, 
that's the most important thing as we alluded yeah. to earlier it's loving what you're doing and if it becomes a chore there's no yeah. that you know there's no shame there's no harm in taking a break from it i've done it you know i've talked about this before in videos that i've done you know about losing that that mojo well go and take a break you know and in yeah. fact gail's yeah. gail's bison's done this as well you know gone through those periods where you just really don't want to pick up a camera well fine go and put it down go and clean your kit put it away in a cupboard go and read you know go and read some books for a couple of weeks or go away on holiday and forget the cameras leave them at home do whatever you've got to do and then you will find that you come back with renewed enthusiasm for it and so a, a change is as good as a rest as they say um, yeah for sure you know. and the thing is people will still be there i mean the one thing that i've I've learned over the last year is, you know, Pete, the incredible amount of support that I've had from people, you know, I'm, I've not really done any, my last photographs were taken, um, probably shouldn't have done, but back in March with the frogs in my mm. pond, they were being all cute and, and I just couldn't resist. Um, but, you know, the amount of support I've had, the amount of people saying, look, you know, we're going to be here when when you come back because you just, you inspire us. And that yeah. actually helps me to think, you know, I do want to get back to my foot. I miss it. I, I can't even explain how much I miss it right now. But, well, you know, ph the, photography the, misses you too, Vic. You know, the, the I, I love said this and to you. that I've had yeah. is, is inspirational to me because it kind of, you mm. know, it, it's that community feel. And I know it's something you're trying to create with Wild Art as well. It's that community yeah. feel. That we're all there for each other, whatever happens. Exactly, um, which kind of kind of brings me on to um, quite the sort of mentoring thing, which I'm just trying to get started with now. If you if you go to the Wild Art website, there's a under the community tab, there's a there's a mentoring oh. section, um, and uh, you know, I so said I'm not arrogant enough to think that I'm I'm better than the you know all the photographers that enter the competition because I'm really not. However, it's not. It's not meant to be, um, you know, I'm going to improve your photography by t teaching you this technique and that technique. That's not the whole point of what I'm trying to do with the mentoring. It's trying to um, take people on this this journey. And, and it's an element that I want to add to that. Um, so base, the basis of it is a sort of one hour Zoom calls where we just we might do a portfolio review. We might talk about where you are with your photography at the moment. We might want, talk to you about where you want to take it. And I just try and help you, you know, along those journeys. So the, the, the first one I'm, you know, I'm offering a free one hour, like no, not no obligation session. So if you want to come along and talk about your portfolio, you want a, a review on that, or you just want to talk about your photography in general, then send me an email. We'll book something up. And we'll have an hour chat. Um, and then going forward, if you, you know, if you find it useful, um, then yeah, there's, there's a charge to that, but you know, it's like, like everything in life, you know, I've got to make a living and there's, <laughs> you know, my time's worth something, but it's it's about getting value out of it for people. You know, it's about taking them on a journey. It's making them feel included, um, and getting them to enjoy their photography and in, in, enjoy that journey that they're they're having. So that's what it's about. It's you know, I'm not arrogant enough to think that I'm I'm better than anybody because I'm I'm simply not. But it's you know, it's, it's not it's not that. It's about trying to develop people as photographers and de develop a direction that they they may wish to change as we were saying there you know your iterations of yourself as you go through your journey and perhaps you know it's it's me helping you get to that next phase in your in your in your photographic career um so anyway go and have a look at that and um send me an email and you know we can we can have a just a, a one hour um zoom chat um, you know, no obligation. Just you know, why not? Why not take advantage of it? So, so go and have a look at that. So, a couple, couple more comments coming in. Uh, Helen Wilson says, "Hi, Rob and Vic. You're both so inspirational. Love that you both are happy to share your experiences. Rob, showing your orchid journey has inspired me uh, regarding flower work and link with wildlife. Also, many thanks to you both. Well, as I said, uh, thank you for that. It's a really kind comment, Helen. But this is what this is all about. You know, it's you know, it's simply that. It's trying to inspire people." For things that Vic and I both love, and obviously, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate situation that you are in the, in the moment, Vic. But you'll get back to it. You know, we've we've had lots of discussions uh, privately about this, so uh, you know, you will get back to it. And uh, you know, it's it, eventually. Yeah, you know, I know it's been a long. I know it's been a long and and rocky road, but you, you're getting there. Uh, yeah, Susie I'm Crow still says, on the breathing at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, well, breathing breathing's important. Yeah, start with the basics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
so Susie Crow says, best of luck with the recovery, Vic, and thanks for the inspiration. So there you go. You know, you're inspiring a lot of people and uh, stick with it. You'll get there. You'll get there. And I will. I, I will. I know there's a few people that follow me on Instagram and probably the issues that I had a couple of months before I had my surgery when my Instagram accounts were hacked and I lost them. I do have a new Instagram account and I'm going to just refill that with some of my past images um, over the next few months until I can get back to sure. back to photographing again. Yeah. But if you receive any weird messages from me, they're not from me. Yeah, that was that was very unfortunate. So, uh, yeah, you've, you've had not had a good run of luck recently. <laughs> No. <laughs> oh dear. Well, you know, these things are sent to try us and it's, you know, I mean, I, why people do this, I, I, I have no idea. It's, it's, it's horrible when you spent so long building these things up, uh, but it just goes to show, you know, how those things can be taken away from us very, very quickly. Um, you know, uh, new start. Thinking. That's the way I'm viewing it. Yeah. It's a new start. Positive attitude. Po oh, is it PMA? Positive mental attitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like. Exactly. That's yeah. good stuff. Right. A couple of comments just to, to, to wrap up with, and then, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you get back to your, uh, your, you know, your afternoon. Um, so Alan James says, thanks, Robin Vic. I need to practice a lot more, obviously. Well, not obviously, Alan. It's just, and it's, I don't think it's practice. It's, um, it's just a question of going out there and experimenting. Call it experimenting. You need to experiment more, not practice, experiment. Um, Rachel Piper says, thank you, Rob and Victoria. You both inspire me. Well, you know, you've taken some very inspirational stuff, Rachel. So, uh, yeah, likewise. Uh, and Mal Ostwick, hi, Rob and Vic. Looks like I've missed this live. We'll catch on. Uh, we'll catch on. We'll watch on catch up later. We'll do, Mal. In fact, Mal's one of those people that's been experimenting with, um, with the long lenses and the flower photography from some of the videos that I've done. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I hope you've been enjoying that, Mal. I've certainly been enjoying some of your pictures that have been sharing on the you know on the on the wild group and in fact if you haven't joined the facebook group um then do go and, and have a look at that and join up so helen wilson says good luck vic love your work so that seems like a, a good place to to wrap things up uh, vic stay on the line we'll have a quick chat afterwards but yeah. um thank you so much for, for for coming on and and sharing all that lovely work and sharing you know some of your hints and tips and secrets um for you know th this wonderful photography that you you know you, you've done over the years and let's hope you get back to it very very shortly i'm sure you will um but well, uh, thank you for having me um, hang around yeah, just, just get, get yeah. out there and, and this time of year is great for actually working on abstracts as well because you've got meadows you've got dry grass you've got seed heads butterfly you've got so much out there so yeah get out there get out there so abstracts is the competition category for august so get out there and and take vic's advice and uh you know, and go and show us what you can do, um, because we, we'd be well, we'd be great to see what uh, what you come up with in that category. So that's open until the end of August. So you you know you've got uh, four odd weeks, you know, to to get involved with that one. So uh, and yeah, give abstract, me a challenge for the judges. Yeah, <laughs> give give Vic a challenge. One of my favourite categories from last year. So I'm really looking forward to what everybody comes up with again in that in that category. That's for sure. Uh, so Vic, uh, thanks very much. Said hold, hold on the line. We'll have a quick chat afterwards. But yeah. I'll just I'll just wrap up, and uh, yeah, and, and say goodbye to everybody. So anyway, thanks thanks for joining. Stay there. I'll just uh, I'll just remove you from the uh, remove from the stream, and I'll, I'll wrap up. Okay. Okay. So thanks very much for watching. I hope that um, that was inspirational and uh, gave you a few sort of ideas to work with going forward. You know, perhaps for abstracts, perhaps for some of the other. Um, categories that we've got left coming up this year and don't forget human nature closes later today um, so if you haven't entered that one you haven't got long left so don't uh, don't leave it to the last minute uh, so looking forward to seeing your images in that one um, and oh last thing to say is just working on uh, i'm sorry i haven't posted too many videos on the youtube channel recently some of those sort of pre-recorded videos i've been doing i've just been busy with other stuff but i have done one on reflections which i've recorded so using reflections in your photography which i think is probably going to be one of the new categories for wild art for next year so hopefully i'll get that up in the next sort of three or four days so uh, if you haven't subscribed to the youtube channel make sure you do that and then you'll get notified and, and ring a ring the bell because then you'll get notifications of new videos as and when they're posted so uh, anyway thanks very much for watching let me just <laughs> line up the outro video he says professionally uh, where are we there we are okay well thanks very much for watching hope that that's uh, you know that's been enjoyable and inspirational and i'll see you again next weekend where we're going to be doing 
where I'm going to be announcing the winners for Behaviour with William Steele. So that's next Sunday, 7th of August, I think 6 p.m., but I'll post that up uh, in, in the next day or two. So uh, until then, bye from me. Thank you.